Hey everybody, it's me, Fiorella. I wanted to have a little chat as to, uh, for you guys, so you guys would know how it's been for me here in Moscow and just kind of put out there any sort of uh, information that I think would be beneficial. A lot of people have been asking me to continue to post pictures and um, I've been sharing this journey with all of you because you're all my fam. And I, this transition has actually been good. It's not been, um, it's been hectic and stressful, but mainly because of the conflicts happening all over um, the world, particularly between, of course, Russia and the United States and NATO and the EU. Um, with the Russia-Ukraine situation that I've been talking about a lot on the show and that um, just many of us have, have been talking about. Um, I'm very happy to be here with some colleagues that I've known um, and that I'm hopefully meeting up with soon. And I am also happy that uh, there are other uh, Americans coming on this journey with me, the reason because it's so diffi difficult and different for us um, because of one, the language barrier, two, uh, I think actually the language barrier I think comes second to the uh, sanctions and the effect of the sanctions. So because of the sanctions that the United States has placed on Russia, many companies left Russia and were forced to not do business here, including the uh, Visa, MasterCard companies, the banks, uh, essentially. So the Visa and MasterCard companies still have an ability to be here, but the issue is actually the banks. So Spurbank is a sanctioned bank, and that's the bank that Russians mostly use. And so that bank is the one that you have to get a card on in order to basically do um, much of anything here. And so it, it's the largest bank. I think there are definitely other banks you can use, but that's the one I'm using. Um, and basically a lot of the banks that worked with Russia decided to not work with them anymore. And so the uh, Russians are able to use a Visa and MasterCard, but it has to have a Russian bank account to it. I can't come in with say my Bank of America account or my digital credit union of sorts and say, hey, I'm going to purchase anything with this because it's automatically rejected by the United States and Russia also. So it's this situation that we're in. So it's really, really difficult to find ways to say send money over to the United States to my other bank account in the United States to say pay for whatever I need to pay for, whether it's a credit card or whether it's student loans, um, which I mean, a lot of us have. And so um, it's been that part I still need to resolve. And uh, that's been the hardest thing because in order to buy anything here in Russia, I had to wait to get a Russian bank account essentially. And uh, thankfully I met some very uh, nice people that have helped me along the way and our our tea has been nothing but great in terms of just helping us helping guide us through this process and so um that's kind of what i wanted to get out of the gate that the sanctions are obviously hurting a lot of people uh, initially they hurt the russians but the ruble, as we all know, has bounced back. The ruble is at an all-time high, which is good for Russians, bad for us um, Americans, but it's uh, good for them. And I think the, uh, the situation that the United States and NATO tried to create has backfired on them and Russia is doing really well. Now, as far as the, uh, the, the sanctions in general, well, they've obviously, hurt uh, us here in the United States far more than they've hurt the intended target, which is Russians. And my colleague, of course, Rachel, talked a little bit about this. Um, and it's this situation where like, we cannot 
use our money essentially and that is just a very small fraction of what people who have been sanctioned by the west experience right uh, people in venezuela the people in syria the people in iran the people in uh, any country that the u.s has sanctioned have been feeling this for far worse than anything i've, I've experienced but just that's the the little bit of fraction where you have some money and you can't use it is extremely frustrating and um ways to circumvent that are going into another country and opening a bank account or opening a bank account that hasn't been sanctioned or um using crypto now crypto is obviously has obviously tanked but let's say you buy it at the regular uh amount you could potentially use crypto i haven't tried that yet i will let you guys know how that works out but I hear the fees are very high and stuff. So um, that's been an issue. Also, things like trying to buy a Russian cell phone. A lot of the companies left trying to buy any sort of like iPhone related American thing. It's very difficult if there was something wrong with my iPhone. Um, the any sort of American product that used to be here, got, like a lot of them gone. Um, you can't find them. Ikea, gone. Um, just normal things that would have been useful to to have right now. I don't have them and neither do, does, do Russians. So it's it's been um, difficult in that sense where, you know, I can't just go and get something familiar. But it's also forcing me to look at other things and see how how people have done things here clothing as far as for work and stuff i haven't you know been able to go and get it but thankfully some of that is uh helped out and just shopping with a language barrier google translate is is good there are other apps that have been really useful to be able to translate one of these apps is called the yandex translation and yandex is like they have a Yandex like taxi, they have a Yandex like food thing. It's like everything here. And it's like they're Google sort of. Um, and so I've been using this Translate app because I wouldn't, it, it's been, I some places don't, a lot of people here don't speak English. And even though it's Moscow, a lot of people, even if they do speak English, it's very like not, it's limited. And so, I intend on taking classes as soon as I can and as soon as my work schedule gets situated. But, um, you know, it's it's a completely different language. It's not Germanic, which I know uh, at least enough to be able to get around and do the regular things because I studied it. It's not uh, Latin based, so it's not a rom romance language like French, which I've also studied a little bit and Spanish, which I know fluently. Or Portuguese which I could pick up a lot of words same with Italian it's completely different <laughs> a completely different alphabet and I um, have no idea what anything says anywhere because of the alphabet and the pronunciation has been tricky for me not only obviously am I do I have an American accent but also um, the the Spanish um, kind of like seeps in there as well and like the German doesn't help either so it, it's been that's also been uh, a challenge but I think I think um, like I said I, I plan on taking classes because I feel that if I'm an American coming into this country I can't expect people to know the language I speak and I want to try to learn their language here I think it is appropriate um, there are people who have been here forever who don't know Russian. So, um, but that's not my intention. I still think it's going to be really hard. Uh, so that, that aside has been difficult. What's been great has actually been the method of transportation here. The taxis are very easy to get either hailing one, but most people use the Yandex app. Uh, and of course, Uber is also one of the companies that left. You can see old Uber, of taxi things uh the little logos um there's also the um trains both the trams and the metro and then the buses 
those last three are so cheap and so effective and I have never seen a better metro and I've been to metros all over Europe and I have yet to see a metro as efficient as this one. I mean, so clean, has Wi-Fi, has charging stations for your phones. Is, is it like, it's beautiful. The stations themselves are like museums as everybody says. And you can learn a little bit of history by just being at the stations. It's like my favorite thing. And then, um, the the way it's done it's just it's just so easy you can like get a troika card which is like this card that you can refill and then you just essentially uh use the card you swipe and then you can continue refilling as, as needed and that card works for the buses the trams and the um metro and also these things that i've seen in latin america which in in Latin America and Peru and in other parts, they're called mi mi micros, like micro buses. So they're like little mini like taxis, but bigger, um, little mini buses, I would say. And like, uh, they basically can pick people up. I haven't used that. I've only written the bus and uh, I've written the Metro and the tram, but uh, I think the Metro is the most efficient and that one goes into the suburbs too. So like, if you don't live in the, like center of Moscow or near the center, then you can still take it into the suburbs or beyond. And there's like a, a different train that will transit uh, outside if you're further out of Moscow, even though it's the center of Moscow. And the center is like one little thing, but like the center, the greater center circle, if you're farther out, you can still get around. And our transportation systems in the United States are an insult. They're a joke. They seem so archaic in comparison. And we supposedly are the richest country in the world. We supposedly have all this money. Obviously, we've talked about it at nauseum where the money is obviously going to a certain uh, group of people. So the, the, I, I don't understand this American um, anti-public transportation sentiment it is so easy and if if you don't want to use it you don't have to you can drive uh you know it's people can can get a car here people drive but it's just not as efficient <laughs> as as uh using the other methods they also have those scooter things everywhere uh bikes too and those scooter things you can rent them as well i'm not gonna use those because i <laughs> like I don't want to get injured while I'm here, even though Putin, not Putin, just kidding, but I have healthcare uh, from Russia. In fact, Russia has given me healthcare um, much quicker than the United States ever did. And guess what? It is, it is not a gigantic deduction from your employment. It is actually like, <laughs> like a normal thing that people get, like that citizens get and that people that work here get. And, um, once I become a resident, there is a reduction in the amount of, of, of taxes paid. Um, Russia is just very, very efficient in a lot of things. There's also a lot of bureaucracy that is hectic, but again, I'm being um, helped by um, RT with that. There's a lot of like, you have to get like, uh, when you leave the country, you have to have this paper. And then you, once you come back in, you have to get another one and it has to keep you can't, it's not what the first paper isn't useful after, um, after you leave the country and then come back. But it's, it's these things that I'm, they're working on making it less bureaucratic. But I mean, when, when I look at the United States and the priorities, I think that that's what's wrong with the, the government. And I frankly, as you guys know, don't think the government can be reformed at this point in the United States' case. I think there are exceptions to reformist ideology in other parts of the world, including Latin America, because of the United States and the West constantly trying to undermine them. Um, Africa as well is a continent that I think is moving in the right direction. And because these countries have actually more fair elections than we do uh, in the United States, and I always say that because it's true, we don't have fair elections. Um, and I will continue saying that until people understand we don't have fair elections. So there's no ability, there's no way to reform these things in the United States. Um, you can try to better things 
what, but they will still be band-aid solutions because they won't actually fix things for the long run. And um, in the United States, for instance, the priorities are a lot of comfort, a lot of um, just like, ex like expedited services, like everything has to come really fast and everything has to happen right now and just abundance and, and if you can get it. And that's not the priority here. Russia's very clean. There's green everywhere. And it's, I know it's summer, but like, I mean, there's parks everywhere. Uh, there's no trash in the streets. Russians don't litter. Um, they don't necessarily recycle big as I've seen here, but they definitely don't litter. And um, the cars are much smaller. There's a lot of uh, mechanical cars, um, like, you know, the stick shift cars um less automatic cars the like i said the cars are smaller the roads are smaller the apartments and dwellings and homes are smaller the uh, suitcases are smaller the people are smaller in terms of uh weight there's a lot less overweight people here people walk a lot more um so they're thinner they uh there's a lot like i don't see the same type of processed foods here in abundance there is uh, more of a, it, it's a very capitalist um, area, Moscow. Uh, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of capitalism here. Vladimir Putin is a nationalist, but he's a capitalist. He's not a uh, communist, as many people would like to believe. But he is a nationalist, and so there is that sentiment of Russian pride uh, but there, there, there's that sentiment of anti-imperialism, but they're still capitalist. And a lot of Russians are very capitalist here. If you go to the center of the city, you will see, you know, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Prada, like a lot of this type of like brand name, fashion, high fashion designers. The, the people also tend to wear those clothes. They tend to like expose these these sort of brands that like to take pictures of themselves there's that aura of being very trying to emulate that part of america which kind of grosses me out because i think that part of america has been the most damaging obviously hollywood plays a big role um you know i was always into movies i've watched uh so many movies i don't sit around and quote them like pasta does but i I understand the allure of Hollywood. I understand why people see that and they're like, wow, it's so cool. Like a lot of people want to come to America still because they think they have this idea that this is how America is. And I tell them that's not how it is at all. That's, that's a fantasy. And, um, you know, even living in LA, there's so many beautiful things about LA that I experience, but there's also a lot of ugly things like the poverty like the, the ridiculous rent prices, like the brutal police force, um, the just injustice against the people. And that's never shown in Hollywood, not to the real extent that it actually, it actually exists because then people wouldn't want, wouldn't have that ideal image of the American dream, which is essentially dead. And so that's what has been exported into Russia a lot. And that European, you know, sense of, of of capitalism where people like to to wear these high-end uh, designer brands and so um it's it's very interesting to juxtapose that next to the old statues of the partisanos in uh the metro the uh, old ussr buildings the ussr factories that are now restaurants bars or an rt studio for example um which is true and so there's there's remnants of the ussr there's like the the, the lenin mausoleum there's you know red square there's all these murals in the metros there's victory park which is um the uh large world war ii museum where they had the the uh just an, a, a memorial to those who defeated the Nazis. And I didn't get to go into the museum. I'm going to go back, but I hear it's a great museum and the park was just really cool with lots of statues, lots of symbolism. And uh, you juxtapose that and, and 
right next to um, the, the capitalist sense. And it's very interesting. There are definitely, uh, there's definitely lots of Russian pride. There's definitely lots of um, people who are anti-West and um, there's also people who are very pro-West. In fact, there's a lot of people who love Americans who, like I said, just want to know more about America, want to, you know, know about the movies and the music. You hear a lot of American music too here. Um, a lot of English speaking music, even though the people, a lot of them don't speak English. And that's something I'm used to in, from Latin America, where in Latin America, for instance, when my parents lived in, in Peru, they knew American music that they didn't really know the word, like understand the words to. And it's, it's that just shows you how much the United States and other parts of, of the Western world have dominated so much of culture. And, um, you know, there's always that battle between keeping the culture of said place and, and letting the new generations into the culture and then also adopting some other bits of the more modern or Western culture. So there's always that um, battle between um, the youth and the elder population. And so I, it's always in the youth where either if the youth know history, they will understand the the current situation but if the youth don't know the history that's where you have a problem where you have an ability to create uh like from the western perspective a color revolution and say well the youth wants this and that and blah 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 uh, so there it's definitely mixed i mean definitely uh the further you get from the center and the the, the, the further you get from the more touristy areas the more uh people are a little bit less uh I would say focused on that aspect and uh, I think also this conflict has shifted people's minds and um, if you go to rural areas is what I hear where you have like more salt of the earth more of an anti-imperialist anti-western perspective than within Moscow itself and that doesn't surprise me because that's exactly how it is in most of the world where you know the capital cities are largely westernized and then the outer skirts are definitely more of the revolutionary uh, areas and so i hope to explore more, more of moscow i hope to go to st petersburg where the architecture is beautiful as i am a fan of uh, beautiful architecture um and museums and that sort of thing and uh it i've i'm surprised as to how hot it is here and I think it's hot because we're so far up north and the sun was like shining on us, uh, especially last week when we got here because the week before that it was raining and it was not cute. Uh, so it's kind of, it's hot, but it's not like Florida hot. It's not LA hot when it's like 110 degrees in Burbank or something like that. Um, it's different. It's, it's hot. And then, but there's at night, of course you get this breeze um it's not super humid it's not super dry either it's kind of in between but it's definitely hotter than i thought i would say like in the 80s upper 80s uh that this past week it's been pretty hot for russia russians are complaining uh, so, uh but a lot of them love it some complain some love it uh they say it's too hot this isn't normal uh, others are really relishing this because the winter is uh intense and uh you know, for me, <laughs> I am not a winter person. I like, I am going to have to buy an entire wardrobe of clothing that I don't have. Um, I bought a couple things when I went to DC and it was freezing cold and New York, but I'm not, I don't do well in, in the cold. So that's going to be an experience. And, um, but I'm told to layer up and just get like the proper coat and all of that. And thankfully I live close to my job. So I don't have to, uh, I, I mean, I could technically I walk to my job essentially, but I don't have to if I don't want to because the taxi ride is very cheap. Um, and so it's, that's going to be interesting. Uh, the heater system, the heating system here is obviously one of the things I looked for in an apartment. Uh, the most important thing, most apartments don't have AC. I found one that did. Um, obviously it's not central AC. Uh, but it, it works just fine. There's a, like I said, there's a breeze that comes through 
and uh, the heater is what I was most worried about. And that's something that Russia has, unlike the rest of, of Europe. So I should be fine in terms of heating. And um, yeah, it's just, just like a quick rundown as to what my experience has been so far. The food, the food, the food. I am Peruvian, uh, Latin American, um, literally Latin American. So, you know, I know American food. I know uh, food from from the global south, from Latin America. I've lived in LA um, for a long time where one of my favorite things in being in LA was going out and eating food, um, particularly food that was not American. So like Thai, like Vietnamese, uh, even Ethiopian, I, I thought uh, was good. New American sometimes, you know, like the, just different styles. Uh, Mexican, Mexican, Mexican. I am a huge fan of Mexican food. It's probably like, I'd say tacos and like Mexican food are like probably my favorite food. It's like between Italian, um, Peruvian and Mexican food for like the top three, right? And holy crap, like I haven't had like tacos in, in, since I've been here. I'm like, and I learned that there's like a Mexican restaurant and I really wanna go. And it's only a few train rides away, train stops away. So I'm gonna have to check it out. But um, I, I miss it, <laughs> I miss, the seasoning of Latin American food um, in general and Italian food. I had a really, really good Italian food here in Russia, but it's kind of hard to explain, but you can tell that the Italian food was made here. It, it, it's all the food tastes slightly different. Like it's, it's almost like you, if you have like a burger, if you have something like fries, it tastes slightly different. And I don't know if it's because we have been conditioned to eat so much shit that when we taste things that are actually not as shitty, that are like healthier, that aren't like, don't have like GMOs and a bunch of like Bill Gates bullshit, like that it tastes better. Or if it's, it's just what the Russians use, maybe they substitute a couple things. Um, it, it tastes a little different. And so it hasn't ex exactly been my favorite place for food because I have really high standards um, for food, but I there are a lot of good like restaurants and stuff that I haven't tried yet. Um, and there's a lot of people that say like the food here is amazing. So I, I'm just, I'm gonna take their word for it and continue exploring, but um, you know, I had, I had like, I had, let's see what I've had. I had Italian food that was good. I've had um, else? sushi. They love sushi here. Um, so there's sushi and that's been good. They also have like those like uh, food court type of things, but the fancy ones like Grand Central Market in LA or Chelsea Market in New York, where you can just go and there's like literally like just all of these kinds of foods and eateries and bars and you can just go and hop. Uh, so that's been uh, really cool to see. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't had Russian food yet because I'm scared of it seems very rich and different and like I can't always read the menu. So, so I, I use the translation thing. So but because I want to try a really good restaurant. I don't want to just get whatever Russian food and then hate Russian food because I had like I tried Georgian food and it was like, okay. It, like, it wasn't necessarily my favorite, but maybe it was just the food, like where I had it. But it was, it was good. It was kind of like pizza. It was like this bread thing that was like cheesy, but it wasn't like, I don't know. It wasn't like the, the most uh, delicious thing I've eaten either. But I think it depends on where you, you go to. Um, and yeah, it's, that's, I think been a little bit like iffy cause I don't know what exactly I'm getting necessarily. Um, but you know, I've gone to some American or English or Irish places as well. Cause I missed fries. Um, and so there's that, 
but I really want to explore more and I don't think the food is uh, bad. Um, I just think it's different and obviously a different type of seasoning, a different type of processing that I think will, will uh, make it different. And um, I've had, you know, horrible food in other parts of Europe, food that is extremely bland. Everybody knows what I'm gonna say, right? English food is like some of the most bland food you, you'll ever have. Um, I love the English, uh, you know, but uh, English music, English literature, food, I think we should leave that to other people. Um, I do love fish and chips, uh, but yeah. So anyway, that, that's been my experience so far with the, the food situation. I wanted to also add that there's a lot of KFC here. They love KFC and apparently they love McDonald's, which I already knew because I saw the long lines when McDonald's opened, but obviously McDonald's is gone. So they basically make their own version of whatever that was. Burger King is here. So they have Burger King, they have Domino's. I haven't had any of that because why the hell would I? Um, and yeah, so there's that American bullshit. <laughs> like again, um, but if you know, you're ever feeling missing American food, I guess that could be a potential for that. Um, yeah, so, uh, and then I guess that's the majority of the experience so far here in Moscow, the internet, oh my God. The internet has been an issue for me in terms of my computer. My computer blocked everything Russian and was not allowing me to connect to the internet. My colleague has the same computer, the sa has a VPN just like I do, the same like even phone plan uh, from AT&T, uh, could connect to the internet, I couldn't on my computer and I don't understand. Um, it wouldn't connect with my phone. I had to have people help me. And of course the Russians came to my rescue and they helped me and it was great. So um, that that was cool. But other than that, um, the internet I think will be like an issue perhaps of how fast it is. I've asked for extremely fast internet, but it's still kind of iffy with the whole situation with my computer and the VPNs and so you need to take them out and put them in. And I don't understand any of that. I am completely lost when it comes to that aspect of computer stuff. So um, did not get that from my dad. So I have no idea, but I got help. So it worked. And so I was, that's why I was able to yesterday use Zoom on my computer, which was really good because I wasn't able to do that and I had to do it from my phone and it wasn't working. So um, that's, I think, an issue um, that they said it had to do with the blocking of from both ends, whatever. And that's part of, you know, the situation that we're in and they were excited to learn more about how to deal with it, which is interesting. And um, yeah, so I, I am pretty content here so far, I think you know, just getting used to a schedule will help. Um, the, the language situation, of course, like I said, and um, the time change, of course, has taken a toll. I mean, it did, it will get better. Um, I basically had to, I've been traveling so much that my whole circadian rhythm has been screwed anyway for a while. And so, you know, when I, I was like in the East Coast, then I was in the West Coast, and I was in the East Coast, and I was in the West Coast, and then I was in Latin America, and then I was in Turkey, and then I was in Russia. So now it's kind of, and I traveled a lot before I got here. It's not like I wasn't traveling and then I just came here. It was like I was traveling everywhere, and then I got here. So it's been this whole situation where um, I've had to really deal with trying to rest. A little bit and I still have so much more to do but it's just been difficult trying to get acclimated but honestly like because it's it's summer here that's another thing the sun doesn't really set um <laughs> like the the sun the the sky never gets really dark at all and it'll be like 
10 and it'll just be like getting dark like it'll just start getting dark and then like 11 12 you'll you'll still see like it'll be dark but it'll it won't you'll still see like the the blueness to the sky and then by like 3 30 4 o'clock there's light again it, it's if obviously we passed the solstice the summer solstice so it's gonna start uh we're gonna start seeing less light but oh my god like you can see it light at like 4 a.m. So I was waking up at 4 a.m. at Moscow time because the light would just wake me up. And so that took a little bit of a turn there. Um, and my work schedule might have me waking up like at the crazy journalist hours where you wake up at like two or three, you know, you have to be on air earlier. So that, that might be part of my schedule, which will be an interesting adjustment because of how early I'll be done with work and then the sleeping aspect of it and stuff. Um, but yeah, it, uh, and you know, we're going to continue obviously doing the show, but it's just, it, it, it's really been interesting and I'm glad I, I'm doing this in the summer because in the winter, it's a whole other story. It's the complete opposite where you only have a few hours of sunlight before it gets dark. And it's like dark most of the day. So that, um, you know, I'm like an afternoon, evening, sometimes night person, not less of a night person than I was before, but I, I just I still have um, issues sleeping in general. So that it's not even that I'm a night person, it's just that I have issues sleeping. But I've been sleeping a lot better here because I've been so tired, so I've been sleeping without any melatonin, without obviously any any other substance to help me. Um, and so I, I think it's kind of working for me, but we'll see what happens when it's like 20 degrees and dark and I have to be up, you know, it's a little bit different. So um, yeah, that's what I wanted to chat with you guys about and uh, just give you a little rundown on that and as far as you know the politics here in general people are living their lives people are are out in the streets they're eating they're they're going out there there's so much life here it is nothing like they tell you in the west you know russians aren't like here like giving me dagger eyes uh, putin isn't trying to go to war with the united states uh but there is a sentiment of um calm right now it you know i was told a few months ago it wasn't like that there was you know chaos there was breaking news there was this there was that now things have kind of calmed down a little bit um there's a lot of questions but people are overall dealing with the situation very well with the, the changes with the stores leaving with the banks and all that stuff like they're they're very resilient and and they're dealing with it and um you know you don't really see this anti-Ukrainian sentiment either. And that's important to note. Uh, you know, when we talk about the news and what's going on, there's a lot of attention paid to foreign policy here in the news compared to the way it's paid uh, in the United States where CNN and, and MSNBC, Fox, all of them focus on the United States more and don't really focus outwardly unless it is already like a manufactured propaganda talking point they don't show multiple sides of a story it's um for a media that is supposed to be according to twitter russia state affiliated media um it seems more uh just independent in a lot of ways than um it, you know they say that they make it out to be in the West, um, and particularly journalists and anchors or presenters, as they know them here, have a lot more say. If they don't agree with something, they can look it up and they can sort of say, oh, I, I don't want to say this or I don't like saying this this way. CNN, you're given something and you're told how to say it. New York Times, uh, uh, there's a lot more freedom in those terms. Um, and let's remind everybody that Russia isn't the one persecuting uh, prosecuting, well, persecuting too, but prosecuting a journalist, Julian Assange, of course, with 175 years and trying to extradite him so he can die 
in the Guantanamo of the United States. So it's just, uh, it, it's, it's very hypocritical to hear about, you know, oh, it's just state media. Well, our media in the United States is corporate owned by oligarchs. So really, I don't understand how they, you know, how you can even justify it. But that is a part of, of what, what's been going on. So I, um, I don't, I'm not seeing that whole um, authoritarian aspect. There's a lot of security here. There's uh, security to go in buildings oftentimes. Um, it's it's not as extensive as say like an airport or something like that. There's security in shopping centers. There is, um, uh, there's a lot of, you know, officers of sorts walking around and, and viewing people, but they're not like, regular cops that I'm used to from like New York and LA. Uh, I don't feel that same, I don't know, like they're gonna come at me and get me in an abuse and like do this. Like I'm not seeing that. Um, like I said, I wanna go outside of, of Moscow and, and really see a little bit more. I wanna go into Ukraine, um, but you know, hopefully as I have more time here, I can plan that more thoroughly. As you guys know, I don't like to stay in one place very long. I, I'm, I don't like to just be in a studio um, protected and not see the rest of the world. So I aim to at least probably use my weekends to, to try to travel as much as possible. And um, the issue is if I say wanted to go to Europe, over the weekend, it would have been easy before. It would have been easy to go to Berlin in like three hours, take a plane to, a plane to Berlin. The problem is now to get back, it's the problem because there's not that many flights and then the flights that are there turn from like a three hour flight to like a 20 hour flight and then you're like missing a day because you have to get back and then it's just a whole thing. And um, that is very unfortunate because you would think that we would want a world where there can be this interchange of of uh, cultures, interchange of relationships, and you could you could have you could visit Russia and Berlin, and then you could go to England. And I would like to go to uh, London for Julian. And that is something I would really like to do, but it's just getting there and getting back um, particularly would be difficult and would probably take some time. And I can't do it yet anyway, but once I can do it, um, I'm gonna look into it, but it's just very difficult to travel because of the whole situation. And that just, um, it is really unfortunate. And uh, yeah, so that that is uh, what's happening. Uh, from the east, from from Moscow, and I really hope to just be developing this more and telling you guys more as I as I find out more. Um, and really, I'm excited to be here and absorb as much information as I possibly can because this is a completely historic time right now. What we're seeing, the rise of uh, Russia, the rise of China the rise of the East, the rise of the global South, um, Africa, the Pan-Africanism, also, of course, Latin America, Central and South America, the pink tide, all of that is extremely promising with at the very least having some pushback towards uh, the West and their attempts to control everything. Um, I think personally, as we've discussed with multiple analysts, that there is a pushback from Russia and certain parts of China. And I, I don't think it's everybody, but I think that there is essentially within government, he figures pushing back against this new global agenda. Um, and that is why the West is so infatuated with this war, with quote unquote winning the war. Because uh, we know it's not about winning the war, it's about endless war, right? As Julian said. And so this war will continue as long as the West and NATO want it to continue. And of course, as Putin said yesterday, if they 
of course, bring in Sw Sweden and Finland into NATO, and then there are weapons pushed there, which the, that would mean Russia would have weapons on its border, we NATO weapons on its border. Um, they're going to have to respond, and that is something we all want to avoid. We should all want to avoid but that is something that, of course, how wouldn't they respond? I mean, they're, they're being surrounded um, with countries that were not supposed to do that. They were supposed to remain outside of NATO. And of course, so with this happening, you're just continuing to poke the flame. And um, it's just not going to end well for anybody in that case. And uh, there are people who don't care, who are willing to destroy the entire world to prove a point um but i think um what i think will happen is uh, eventually this this war will be the west is uh, new afghanistan the u.s is new afghanistan and um they're going to try to pretend that they have a chance for as long as they can and then just quietly move out the united states is currently going to venezuela trying to issue these this relationship uh, negotiations for oil, uh, but uh, outwardly, they're still recognizing Juan Guaido as interim president. You can tell that's just facade; it's for show. Again, this is this is you know this is the United States. That is the foreign policy of Anthony Blinken and the State Department. That's what they're going to do. Um, it's not genuine. Obviously, Maduro isn't going to uh, just take their word on anything. Venezuela and Russia have a very close relationship and the moment that we're living right now is, is strengthening those relationships um, ex ex like extremely and there's other countries that have that similar tie to Russia. You've got Cuba for one um, and you have of course Nicaragua and China is also working with Nicaragua as well. So you have this whole situation um, of relationships, Iran, of course, and then you have the BRICS summit that happened that we've talked about. So this is this is definitely a trend towards a multipolar world, how that unfolds and who remains in control and the nefarious and good actors is all up for determination. But I think at least there is a pushback right now and that pushback is being utilized by nations that couldn't push back a little before via this united front against the west and the west is going to have to fall for any real uh, progress to happen because the reason there is uh, only ref uh, there's a sense of uh, reformism in a lot of these countries and not full-on revolution is because they're afraid of getting cooed because they have been cooed because they have been um you know the they have the military us has military bases in their countries example colombia example honduras right where they they can't go full on okay let's join like <laughs> let's go and 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 join cuba and like have a revolution against it that would be great but you have to understand the way th that they can get a lot more done the way things say manuel lopez obrador AMLO, Andres Manuel López Obrador, was able to do this in Mexico and how he has navigated those waters, I think has been intelligent from a country that is right next door to the United States, right? And also, of course, the uniting bridge to much of uh, Central and South America. So that that is essentially what people who don't understand Latin American politics don't get is there is a difference between the political world in the South, in the global South, um, particularly Latin America and Africa uh, as a continent. And then um, how we do things in North America, we are not at that reformist stage because we are, our government is the one doing all of this damage to these countries. So there's no reforming that because that is how they base what the economy is based off. It's based off war. So there's no reforming that. You can't reform that because that, that in whole intent is to capitalize on war. And so that is irreformable. Whereas these nations, they are living the results of imperialism. So there are things they can do to make people's lives better. Water, roads, 
education, all of these things that we take for granted, they don't have. And so their method, their, um, their message are different. Their, the moment in time they have is different, which is why time is ripe for a revolution in Latin America and in the Africa, because they, they're at that stage. We are at a different stage. So essentially that is the, the reason why you can't just unif unilaterally say, oh, we all just need to do this. Um, and if you have that opinion, please go and talk to um, people who live in these countries. You as an American cannot demand what you think is best for them because then you end up in the same place as these war criminals and warmongers that think they have power, the, that they're entitled to tell people how they should run their countries. The, the main thing a lot of these people want is the United States and the West to stop infringing on their, their, their politics, to stop trying to col co uh, colonize them in this neo-colonial way, to, to stop extracting their resources, to just, just mind their own business. That's a lot of what these countries and the people of these countries want. And sure, some of them want to still have a good relationship with the United States because they're a potency. Um, but this is why you're seeing the shift to open relationships with China, particularly, and even Russia, to not be so adversarial to Russia uh, because they uh, see that the ec economic sector is headed towards a multipolar world. It would be dumb to try to stay behind and not open up relationships, not just with those giant countries but in the economies, but also with their neighboring countries. Like, for example, Gustavo Petro reaching out to Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. They're neighbors. Why the hell would they fight? Why that? Why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense. And so that they have more in common and things they could achieve. And so that sense of unity and pride in in, in you know in South America and Central America in Latin America and in Africa is really uniting people just inadvertently against the the West because they're all victims of that. And that was what the BRIC summit, how it was formed. They're all victims of Western imperialism in one way or another. So the, that's just like the geopolitical aspect as to why I'm happy to be here in this moment because there's this relationship built between the global South and the East that's happening. And I think it is a pivotal moment to be here and to be able to explore more of that and talk about it and see the different side of news that I get versus the West. When I'm in the West, I have to look here and here. I'm able to see more of that openly. And um, I've already seen and experienced that so far from being here. And I think that's a wonderful aspect of everything. So um, just wanted to do this video out there and uh, I have a couple more things coming up, but thanks so much for, for supporting us. Please feel free to uh, subscribe, obviously share, and if you can, join our Patreon and um, I will be doing more little uh, live uh, or little videos from Moscow that I will put up there as well. And uh, yeah, just just thank, thanking you all for continuing to support us in spite of the censorship, in spite of the, the shadow banning, the YouTube bullshit. Um, Rockfin has been a great platform for us and we have been very, uh, very lucky to have that platform. We want to continue expanding out more. We're going to continue to con do this and expand outward as well. So as always, thank you all for your support and much love to you all. I'll see you soon. Come out. Bye.